Well, hello everyone. It's the morning of day three of my Natchez Trace bike tour. And, before, and in this morning before I left the Meriwether Lewis camp area, I um, visited some of the historical sites around the area, including the grave of Meriwether Lewis, who was a co-captain of the Lewis and Clark expedition. I visited a replica of the inn that Meriwether Lewis stayed in on the last night of his life. And I also learned more about the history of the Natchez Trace. Talking about the history of the ha Natchez Trace, um, we should probably go through some of the background of why I feel that this is such an important part of American history. And that takes us back to the 1750s when England had some coastal colonies, but most of North America was dominated by France and Spain. In uh, 1754, the French and Indian War started, and the French and Indian War is the name of the war that we call it here in North America. The rest of the world calls it the Seven Years' War. And this was sort of a world war to determine who was going to be the superpower of the of the world, France or England. And at the end of that war, England won the war. And in North America, England got every all of the territory east of the Mississippi River, and Spain was ceded territory west of the Mississippi River. So Britain got all this new land, including Canada and all of New France, east of the Mississippi. And as this map shows, the British thought that it would be good to create an Indian reserve in the middle of the continent, but the American tourists, the American uh, colonists were not going to have any of that. They started flooding west pretty quickly. In fact, so quickly that in 1763, the British created a proclamation saying, no settlement west of this line. But that didn't stop the American colonists. They just kept flooding westward. And finally, in areas like Ohio and Kentucky and Tennessee, there were thousands and thousands of, of uh, colonists uh, settling that area. The issue was that these, co these colonists were completely economically cut off from the rest of the United States. The Appalachian Mountains didn't allow trade to happen east and west. So the only way for these settlers to sell their product, whether they were growing corn or tobacco or cutting lumber or um, making whiskey, whatever they were trading, they had to float it down the Mississippi River to Natchez, which was the last British settlement on the Mississippi River, and then they had to trade with the Spanish who controlled New Orleans. So essentially these colonists out west were isolated and could only trade with a foreign country of Spain. So that's why it was strategic that in 1801, President Thomas Jefferson made the Natchez Trace the first national road and ordered the military to improve the road so it was more efficient, safer for people to traverse, and they felt like the United States government had their back. Because there was a lot of talk at the time about this part of the war country separating and create, creating its own republic. And if that had happened, the, the history of the United States would be completely different. So I believe that the Natchez Trace held it all together. So with that said, that's why it's such a great privilege to be able to bicycle tour along this, this parkway that roughly follows the Natchez Trace. So on day three, I traveled the re through most of the rest of uh, Tennessee to the town of Collinwood, Tennessee. And so everybody knows Collinwood is a very bicycle-friendly town. They're very friendly to bicycle tourists. They let you camp in their, in their uh, town park. Their welcome center has restrooms and showers for bicycle tourists to use. And it's really the first town on the Natchez Trace that's directly on the Natchez Trace since I left Nashville. 
When I got there, it was projected to rain that night, so they let me stay in their volunteer fire department, which was a big room with showers and restrooms and a big couch to, uh, to sleep on. And most importantly, electrical outlets. I was able to recharge all of my electrical equipment that night in Collinwood, Tennessee. And based on the whiteboard that was in the room, I wasn't the only bicycle tourist that got to stay in this, in this volunteer fire department. There were big groups of bicyclists in the past that have come through and wrote notes on the whiteboard, which was really great. The start of day four brought rain. And it was a, a downpour of rain. All morning, it was wet and rainy. In fact, when I got to the Alabama state line, it was raining so hard and the wind was blowing so hard that I could hardly even film the crossing of the state line. So that's all you get is that little blur of a, of a sign that says Alabama state line. It rained all morning long, but by the time I got to the Tennessee River, where the Natchez Trace crosses the Tennessee River, it did start to clear up and the sky was getting a little blue. And 10 or 15 miles further along, when I crossed into the state of Mississippi, it, the rain had all cleared up. That, day, that night, at the end of day four, I got to the, let's see, what's it called? The Tishomingo State Park. Tishomingo State Park. <laughs> a beautiful campsite on the edge of a lake, and the weather cleared up. Day five was a beautiful morning. Cool, crisp, and uh, I, got, I got going pretty early. Here I am at milepost 300. 300 more miles to Natchez. Yahoo! Day five, I stopped at some of the sites along the, the trace, including some Indian mounds. part of the old trace that is preserved. And at the end of day five, I wound up in Tupelo, Mississippi, where I checked into a hotel and um, then saw some of the sites of Tupelo, including the birthplace of Elvis Presley. Well, that's a wrap-up of uh, this video. Um, join me for the next video where I talk about more of my bike tour of the Natchez Trace. See you later. Bye.